Hey boys and girls, welcome back to Monroe, um, Monroe Life. We're, uh, we're in the process now of uh, tearing things down. This may look like it can roll, but it has no suspension at all. <clears throat> it's, um, wheels are off. Uh, we've taken a few of the panels off and we're starting to do the costing and the reverse engineering on this car. But today what we're gonna talk a little bit about, or I, actually Carl's gonna talk a little bit about, is the interior. So um, Carl's just uh, come to us uh, after 10 years of working uh, with the different uh, tiers and OEMs on interiors. And he's gonna give us a brief description of everything that's going on inside. And with that, Carl, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. And so in my life in interiors, I started out in research and innovation. We would work on different manufacturing methods, but then also different materials and applications. Moving into seating, it was mostly in uh, higher volume vehicles. So trying to put something as many out the door as we can at the best cost we can with the best design and assembly easier process. All the way down to working on high end vehicles with extremely low volumes. Some of them maybe 300 vehicles a year down to a program with just two a day. And their decision making when you're dealing with a vehicle that is only making two a day is completely different from a vehicle that's making 300 per day. So depending on what you're actually looking at, you have to change the way you think and the way you would normally design something. And for this vehicle being a $140,000 car with a very high-end interior, there are some decisions that they may have made that they probably would not have made if this was designed to be a $25,000 car. Oh, great. Let's find out about um, what you saw that you liked and what things could be improved on. Sure. So you had already mentioned the seats. The driver's seat is a fairly nice seat. It has very nice materials. Just looking at the form and the shape, it's beautiful. Uh, the stitching, contrasting stitching, two different colors, depending on where it is at the, in the vehicle, with a contrasting color piping or welting. Um, this is actually a nice feature because you can change that color, change that material for different trim levels, different options, and it's already in the design, so no additional cost other than half and half another roll of material on your shelf. The comfort of the seat you had called out, unfortunately, I was never able to drive this vehicle. Um, but well, feel in, free to, you know, you can take a nap. In it oh, later. all right, maybe, <laughs> maybe some afternoon. But when you're actually looking at that, a lot of these seats, the main cost is in the seat cover or in the electronics. This seat cover, when you're looking at the way they would lay out all of their different patterns, they're very, very square, very, very rectangular. That means that those patterns are gonna nest nicely within each other, except for this one. You'll notice that big sweeping curve. Since you have a selvage edge on both of those pieces, this upper piece does not nest within this big U-shaped piece here. So when you're laying that out on the table, depending on how you fit that, you might end up throwing away that piece of material on every cut that you make. On a vinyl type material, a PVC type material, you would normally estimate about a 60 to 65% utilization per that roll material. So if you're paying for this seat, just know that 35% of that material that they had to throw away on their floor, you're still paying for that as well. Yeah. Depending on how you lay out your seams and how you lay out your patterns, you can improve that. Um, so it's one thing that you can really look at how they're actually laying out their material. Um, the rear seat, the criticism there is in comfort, and we'll have to really look at that of why that is, what the angles are, how the foam is laid out. But one thing I thought was kind of interesting is, even though this is a rear seat, if you look at the way they've integrated their bolsters, it is actually the same formation as a normal captain's chair. Mm. However, because it's hard up against the rear, you have no movement, you have no uh, a way to adjust that. So if it's not at the angle that fits your body, you're never gonna get it the way you want it. Um, but I think that it is quite unique to have that bolster in there without just having it a flat section. Moving in from the seats, you're going into the IP. Now they've made some decisions on that instrument panel that I think are really, really nice. It is a uniform piece going all the way across the front. Just look at this wood trim continuing all the way down. If this was a normal vehicle, what you would have is you would have an air vent, you would have some sort of a filler panel. You would have your cluster, another filler, filler panel, the center air vents, the passenger panel, and then the air vent on the other side. Now, Sandy, you always have a lot of criticism for when we're looking at the gaps in vehicles. 
And I think one thing that's <laughs> important for people to know is why are we actually picking on those gaps? Those gaps could mean that either the component was off, those gaps could mean that the carrier that they're attaching to is off, or those gaps could mean that it is just a poor design. I've been in uh, OEMs go having to be called to the assembly line because they have a problem, they have a, they're having a build issue. They're looking at a panel, it's not fitting right. Pop the panel back off, put it on again, and it fits right. All right, so what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the component is wrong. That means that the actual design is wrong. If it can be done two different ways, if one works, one does not, that means it's just not a robust design. Because of this choice to have that linear look and getting rid of all those extra pieces, you eliminate all of those gaps from one component to the other. And that just simplifies all of that process. It simplifies all of that headache. So having that seamless look is very important in my mind. Yeah. Well, for me, um, I like the clean look. I'm a big fan. Uh, we've been guessing at the, uh, the wood here. I think it's black walnut. That's, that's what it looks like. And uh, that's, uh, that's a wood that we don't have to worry too much. It's not like some of these African products that, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's three trees left and, oh, we decided to put one in, uh, yeah. in, in our car. So um, I, think, I think that the, uh, the choices that they've made um, with the materials, like Alcatara on the size, to me, uh, actually, why don't you, you didn't talk about the pillars, but- uh, Not yet. Yeah. But anyway, uh, to me, um, that, that really screams luxury. It's, I don't know if it's the most expensive, but it is an expensive product and it, it just feels like, you know, welcome home, brother. That you know, is that a foam-backed artificial suede material and it is one of the more expensive products that you would use in a vehicle. I would guess that that could be around $50 a square meter for that type of material yeah. on up depending on what type of negotiation and what type of volume they're uh, buying in. Mm. Um, the vinyl materials, depending on what it is, maybe around $20 a square meter. Um, so it is definitely a costly yeah. choice yeah. to switch to that um, artificial suede for the headliner and the B-pillars. What do you think about the, um, the yoke? All right, that's, that's unique. So I would have to actually drive it to get used to the feel of it. but that is entirely wrapped. Not only is it what you would consider like a wrapped steering wheel, the entire shroud is a wrapped component. Yeah. Um, I've worked with some OEMs that have tried to do that. Most of the time, they're gonna try and carry over an existing shroud and say, well, put material on it, doesn't fit. You can't assemble it with that extra material. This vehicle, I do believe, was designed from the beginning to have that there. Um, which enabled them to have that full wrap shroud. And it, it looks beautiful. It feels very nice. Uh, you don't get the clicky, hard plastic sound tapping yeah, it. It's, yeah. I, I do like it. Yeah, well, I'm telling you, um, I liked that from the first time that I got in it. Corey was, uh, his, you know, he was out, uh, uh, the jury was out with him as far as he was concerned. But for me, the very first time I got in it, I loved it. I, I really like it. It's a little tough, okay? You have to turn it in a little different fashion, but Corey and I don't drive cars the same way. I'm kind of like a three and nine kind of guy, and he likes to have his hands on the top of the wheel. Personally, <laughs> I don't like to do that because I can't, see, I can't see the speedometer. I can't see things that I need to see under a normal circumstances. But to me, this worked out just fine. And to me, the feel, the feel of it, this just feels like it's really well made. I just love that. I like it when I can touch things and uh, the more senses that, that, that you can invoke when you're putting a car together, the more things like the scent, the feel, the look, on and on. And, and quite frankly, the noise. If it's noisy, that's a real problem for me. I, I just really like the, I think that that, that yoke is like brilliant. So uh, I, I'd, I'd like to see if I can get that. Uh, everybody knows that I'm, I'm getting a, uh, a cyber truck and I'm telling you, I really like to have the yoke and the cyber truck. So one thing that you also may not have thought about is that yoke increases safety as well. Yeah. So the people that grab at the top of the steering wheel, if that airbag deploys and the airbag is coming out below your hands, your elbow does not bend in that manner. Yeah. If you're holding there, you'll break your arms break your elbows and yes. actually i took karate for 
quite a number of years. And if you're in a knife fight or if somebody comes at you with a knife, you grab with your left hand because that's his right hand. That's what's going to be coming at you. What's the very first maneuver? After you've got a hold of that guy's wrist, I come up like this to break his elbow backwards. And to me, uh, airbags are great. I, I, I know they've saved lots of lives. I, I really don't like the idea, though, of having my elbows broken. And when I saw airbags go off and looked at, if, I'm, if I've got my arms at the top of the, either they're going to throw them up into the, uh, into the headliner or they're going to break them, and neither one of those really uh, appealed to me. Yeah, in my vehicle safety training, we were looking how people are actually using their steering wheels. 10 and 2 is not the way you do it anymore. It is 9 and 3. Yeah. Also, people, when they are turning the wheels, there's a certain group of people that they'll reach their hand onto the inside of the wheel to continue the turn. That's just as dangerous if that airbag is going off. You don't have that inside to grab here. Yeah. You could still try and grab the inside of the yoke, but that type of formation, I do believe, actually forces you find, you, you a find safer yourself situation. dropping the top and picking it up with the bottom. Yeah. That's what I did, and that's what Corey does now. Yeah. And if you look at him when he was racing, I mean, if you're racing, you, you don't move your hands much at all. Uh, the more movement you got, more likelihood you're going to spin off uh, into Never Neverland. So I. Um, um, I di unfortunately didn't get a chance to, to drive this thing on that track. Um, contrary to what Corey said, <laughs> I was really sick, really <laughs> sick. Uh, that's the only reason I didn't, I didn't go out there. But I, uh, I'm telling you now, um, uh, I, I just think that this thing is just made for going fast. And I think road racing with this would be spectacular. I don't know about the Y or the 3, but with this, with the, with the power, instant power that you've got, and I don't know if you, you heard, but, um, okay, so you hear Corey on those, those videos going around the track, and you can hear the tires squealing. They squeal all the way around because this has nothing but power. And the only way that you're going to hold something onto the track, for me, would be at, at 3 and 9. And having that the way it is that that would be the ideal scenario for me for driving yep. so uh, i unfortunately didn't get a chance to drive it really on that kind of a course but i would have I, i'm going to tell you right now that's what i want so, so when we were looking through this vehicle basically from the floor to the headliner they chose a premium material throughout but even though these are all premium materials they did not select a lot of jewelry you have a few chrome accents, the nice wood grain, but there's nothing that's too distracting. So if you look at the driver airbag cover, they have an embossed Tesla logo into the cover. It is not a separate emblem or component. It just cleans everything up in the general look of the vehicle. Yeah. And I, I like that. I was complaining with uh, one studio I was working with a while ago that you know how some people would go overboard if it was... What I actually said was to the designer, um, your vehicle looks like this is 1985 and you just got a bedazzler. You have some yeah. decorative feature, you want to pop it onto everything that's too much. You actually want it to be a little more subtle. The subtle look throughout this vehicle I think is very, very nice. Yeah, well, I'm 100% I'm in agreement there. I'm not a fan of Chrome. Uh, after, you know, I, I grew up where pff, heavy metals, so what? Um, but, uh, but after seeing a couple of uh, guys that were my masters when I was a toolmaker, uh, basically go over, uh, they basically died eventually um, uh, because of uh, heavy metals. I'm not really a big fan anymore. Yep. So if it was up to me, I'd even, I'd drop the chrome on the, uh, on the seat adjusters as well. So the top hat. This is a wrapped top pad, real stitching, but I do believe that this is a direct wrap to an injection molded substrate. I would guess so. There yes. is no padding there. Yeah. And this was a debate that we had a while ago. There are some OEMs or some people that think it's very luxurious to have a nice cushy who feel on top Who touches it? That's, exactly. I, who in the world is going up there, all right, I'll, I'll just let me feel like, I, I just, are you kidding me? The, the, the areas that you would contact, sure, but the area that you are not, not necessarily. 
But this gives it a good look. It, stitch, it's a very good look. Stitch and also, top is nice. Really I nice. don't know what they did for demisters, but look at the corners of this IP. It is clean. There is yeah. nothing there. Yeah. A lot of vehicles now, you're going to have some sort of an air vent, some sort of a bezel that either has to be loaded in from the top or the bottom. And working around those areas is a pain right. and with a lot of different tolerance issues. This is very well done. Um, the stitching itself. Because this comes off of a roll, you can have very, very big pieces. But if you were to get a good look, you'll notice that the stitch comes up over top of the center cluster and then continues and it's straight off to the side. You do not need that stitch on the sides, but you do need it above that cluster because it bends in two different directions. They had an option. When they brought the stitch around the cluster, they could have dove it back and died into the vehicle, but they decided to keep it and run it straight across the sides. If you because measure- it looks, it looks finished. It looks finished, but if you measure the distance from that seam to the front of the cluster, it's a short dimension. If you measure that distance off to the side, it gets much bigger. Now, I think that there are two reasons why they may have done it that way. The first is I never like two parallel straight edges too close to each other. Yeah. Because if you have any inconsistency, it just gets amplified by two straight seams side by side. So it's better to separate them by a distance. You could not do that because the seam was needed at the cluster, but you could do it on the sides. The other option or the other possibility, in order to have that seam lay flat, there is a recess in that substrate to allow for the selvage edge from the sewn material. That recess is going to cause B side of that substrate to have some sort of a formation. Right. They may have needed to push it back to get across the air vent area on that side to get that farther away from the edge. I don't know, to me, that's a beauty line. It um, is. And uh, I don't like style lines because they never work. Um, and, and actually, we just uh, did a review of a car and, uh, and I said what they should have done was they should have had one contiguous piece like what you see here because when you try and get style lines on this door and that door and header, header doors, when you try and get those style lines to work, you, it's like impossible. You just tell the workers to do it. Just tell them to work. Well, guess what? If you, that's an impossible job. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't make it work. But with this, this is a beauty line. I can, I can make that work all the time. And if there is a miss, an, uh, an, an alignment issue, no one's ever going to see it. Same thing over here. So, and then going on a Y, when you're in the driver's seat and you're looking over there, it looks perfect. Uh, because the, the, the dimensioning and whatnot is a little different as you get to the other side of the car for the guy that's sitting in the driver's seat. And this is usually the person who owns that vehicle. So making it look good is, uh, is tip top on my, uh, my uh, list of things to do. So that is actually one criticism that I have. I love, I prefer leather over PVC or vinyls. That's my own opinion. Um, leather is a natural material, PVCs are made from oil. And I know a lot of people are very excited about the Tesla getting away from oils. Well, we're still using fossil fuels and oils throughout all of this. People say, well, I don't like leather seats because they get too hot. That's actually not true. Leather does not absorb heat as much as PVC or vinyl, yeah. the oil bases. But people don't know the difference when they're feeling PVC or leather. So when they hop on a vinyl seat and it burns their backside, they think that's a leather seat and it's hot. It's not true. When I was processing leather components and PVC components in our assembly plant, I actually had to turn up the cycle time to nearly double on leather components compared to PVC because leather does not accept heat as much, which is also why we make jackets out of leather, things like that. Um, also, no animal is killed for their leather. It's a byproduct of the meat industry. So for us to be as environmentally conscious, we use every component of the animal. <clears throat> Using those leathers is actually of a benefit. We go all the way down to processing the bones for gelatin. Um, it all depends on what you want. My personal, I like leather, but what I don't like, I don't like power seats. I'm the only person that drives my car. I want a leather seat that I can sit on. I don't wanna pay an additional $300 for all of those motors that sit in the vehicle that get adjusted once and then sit there for the rest of their life. I will pay for the leather. I won't pay for the power. That's never an option for me. Mm. I always have to have power seats if I want a leather seat. But that's my own opinion. 
Well, here's the deal. I love leather, and the reason for that is because all of the reasons that you said, plus on top of it, that is not something that I have to pump out of the ground and turn into, uh, turn into vinyl. Um, I, think that, um, I think that the reason that they did not go with leather is because of the um, PETA group, okay? Yep. And um, that's all well and good, you know, they don't want to eat meat and all that, and they don't want animals killed and all this other stuff, but to me it's a waste because I know that, um, that mm, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the skins, and they do remove the skins when they uh, cut it up to make a roast or a steak, a lot of those skins go straight into the scrapper, and to me that's just a giant waste of money and time. Plus, um, the more we can utilize the animal, the better off. Uh, it, the more I feel uh, is right, if you like. So uh, leather for me, I, I prefer the, the feel. I just don't like uh, usually paying for it. So I'm usually <laughs> a cloth guy. But as far as the seat adjustments, there's where you and I, <laughs> we, we depart. Because um, <clears throat> I can tell you right now, I never get the opportunity to uh, have a car that's just mine. I've never, I've never had, I, actually that's not true. My Morgan Super Sport, yes, I, that was just my car. I never let anybody else drive it. Um, but it didn't have much of a way of adjustments either. I, you, you basically took the floor, uh, it, it, it was bolted to the floor. Your, your seat uh, cushion was bolted to the floor. And if you wanted it hotter or softer on the seat, you took the inner tube that was in there and blow it up or, or release the air from it. That's, and, and I had it made special for me, or I did it special for me. For this, um, I'll get in and, um, and my little stubby legs uh, will want it in one position. And then my wife, who has legs from here to China, she gets in and it's in a totally different spot. So, and, and trying to adjust back and forth is just one of those things that I spend two or three minutes with every time I get into <laughs> a car. So uh, I'm a big fan of that because I, I just, I have to share everything. Once we can get this cart, torn apart i really want to look at the mechanism and how it functions yeah, yeah so on an older design all right you have a seat that moves forward and back and then you have a seat that moves up and down so you basically have a rectangle of movement that is within that design a parallelogram yeah. but that entire rectangle is not needed if you are a tall person and you need to move your seat back you are also needing to move your seat down you're not going to have a person that is all the way back and all the way up if yeah. you are a shorter stature and you have to move your seat farther away forward, you're not going to be all the way down. You're going to be up. There are different ways of designing mechanisms that actually move into what I would call a banded arc so that your movement is allowed within that area. It changes the way you would do the yeah. gearing, changes the way you do the tracks. I want to see how they work that out once we can actually get it apart, see how it moves. Actually, when I worked at Ford before they gave away seats, um, uh, we came up with a cam action for that. So um, that did something similar. And all it was, was we just took a piece of extruded uh, uh, sheet metal, uh, which was the track, and then we just arced it down because as you say, you have to move rear and you have to also drop down if you've got somebody who's really tall. There's very, very few guys that have got really long legs and, and a short body. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen that way. So <clears throat> we put it out there, but unfortunately that was just before Ford decided to uh, get out of the seat business and get rid of the cushion rooms and things like that. So this, this seat is made by Tesla themselves. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, that's a real good idea because to me, core competency means I'm gonna be focusing my attentions on what the customer actually touches. And um, sensitive butts are, uh, are something that I think uh, some car companies have kind of like missed the boat on. They're looking for something cheaper, less expensive, I should say. And, uh, and in fact, in some cases, in order to make that happen, seat manufacturers have to utilize parts that they've utilized for mm -hmm. some other seat because it's cheaper for them and they have to hit their, their dollar factor from the, uh, from the OEM. And what you wind up is um, <clears throat> several carbuncles world, you know, welded together and, and, and you wind up with a seat. So I'm looking forward to, seeing the comparison between this seat and the Model Y because um, Elon told me that all the seats are the same now. So I, I yeah, trust but verify <laughs> or something along those lines. 
Yeah, so I'm um, a believer in verify. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to you um, diving into these things here. So one w statement that you made a little bit ago is paying attention to things that you touch. So one thing that I noticed that I don't see in this vehicle that I'm happy for is piano black. Yeah. I, piano black finishes throughout the vehicle became a fad that stuck around for too long. <clears throat> Never keep them clean. They're always smudged. So and they seem to attract dust. Yes. It's like dust can slide through the door and somehow get onto piano black. So an so. into the door, it is a fully wrapped door from top to bottom. It has a mixture of PVC wrapping and fabric. Now I'm trying to understand, I'm almost thinking that there are two different PVCs here. This top yeah. does not have a foam backing directly on the vinyl. Because of these hard corners that we can feel on some of these trim edges, I do believe that they have a wall in the substrate, they have a die cut piece of foam that is in the main area, and then it's hard wrapped on the edges. Mm. However, once we go down, we can feel this part. It actually has foam that wraps around the edge. So I do believe that this is a foam backed PVC. Yeah. So the utilization, they're going to have to have separate rolls on their assembly line to make those materials. Now, when you're dealing with those PVCs and you're trying to nest them in your pattern, they're not directional. You can cut them any which way, you can fit them in nice and tight to try and use as much of that roll as you can. However, they're fabric. You'll notice that there is actually a weave pattern in this fabric. In order for that weave to match in all four doors where it is used, that has to be cut in the same orientation on the roll every time. Which means that everything that does not fit within that orientation, you're gonna be scrapping a lot more of that fabric. I don't know what the cost of the fabric is. Maybe it's negligible, negligible for them. Um, but I don't like patterned materials for wrapping because of that utilization issue. But again, when you buy a luxury car, you're expecting, yes. uh, you're expecting some of this stuff to be waste. At $140,000, this is yeah. a premium car. Yeah. And, and to me, having that look like you're looking at some stuff that's got a bit of a gloss and then there's some that's dead flat and as far as color is concerned or for sheen is concerned and having that Mm, that mix, if you like, makes the, uh, makes the interior just look a little more elegant. Elegance is kind of like what you'd want to have if you're fooling around with this kind of a vehicle. Now, one thing that I want to mention is when they're coming up with a design, the studio designer is coming up with the shape. They'll pass that off before they've actually picked a material. So when a person is trying to give wrapping feasibility or design feasibility they're trying to think in their head saying yeah that should work that should work with that material however sometimes it doesn't and this might be very hard to pick up on the camera but if you look at the grain of the material here and then compare it to the grain of the material that you'll see on the corner you'll actually see that there is a pattern that shows through on the corner right here that is not visible in the rest of the area what that pattern is is that that material could not be stretched around to the side facing seam this seam should have been much closer to the edge. Because not, that could not be stretched, that material is actually showing the woven backing of the PVC. So the PVC material will most likely only be about 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters thick. The rest of the material is going to be a fabric going up to about a one millimeter thickness. That fabric has a weave on the back. That weave texture on these hard cornered areas here it is actually showing through. I saw it here and I saw it on the uh, rear door on the other side. This has a much tighter corner than the front door, which has a much more generous radius. Mm. So they picked a design before someone actually held the material in their hands and said, can that material actually do that? Yeah, so stretch. I think it's important to select material early on yeah. so that they can actually give that feasibility. And actually the they could have had that more generous radius if they wanted to. Um, this, is a, this is basically a style line as well. So you'll see that the generous radius is here, but they could have probably changed it around a little bit. Um, again, <clears throat> what people have to remember too is that um, automotive engineers are gonna be a whole lot more picky than the average buyer. Most people will never notice the things that uh, for us are staining out like a sore thumb, um, but the average person would never ever see. One thing I did like though was this tight, um, absolutely wonderful little line right here. I'm 
very impressed with that. So that they carry that line all the way down the door, which goes yeah. through multiple multiple components. Yeah. Now carrying that line down, especially in a situation like here, can cause a misalignment, which again, most people would never see if there is a misalignment. Um, but here, they could have had a sewn on side face, which they chose, which causes two different materials, pieces. Right. Yeah. Or they could have had a single dart seam ending here or coming up and ending here. This face could have been part of this pattern mm -hmm. and one piece pulled together and then a dart seam closing it up. However, just the style of a more consistent look is so much nicer right. than just ending. It is. This, this to me, I look at little features like this and it screams out, this is a this is a real true luxury car. Yes. And um, and putting a you know a folded panel over the edge with a, with a seam there, that would be to me anyway. Oh yeah. Well, hmm. you know they 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 wanted to save a couple of bucks or this way it gets rid of a, a little bit of scrap. But this this is going to be beautiful forever, whereas no one's going to remember uh, you know fifty cents worth of uh, uh, the material that was tossed in and the And I can tell you that is a big headache in the initial design because in order for this to sit nice and flush, you have to have a seam Scaving. trench yep. put into yep. the side, which means more than likely you have to have a lifter inside of this area. Now the nice thing about this, you'll see that there is no uh, lock or anything like there. Mm -hmm. A lot of problems with having that lifter to pull out this is that you have some sort of an additional attachment or a doghouse in the injection mold that die locks this area, preventing them from putting in that seam. Yeah. So if you think about it from the beginning, knowing that you're going to be designing for wrapping, then yes, I'm going to move that pillar. If you design this as a plastic component and said, all right, let's throw in a seam. Well, now that pillar's in the way and you can't move it because you already designed it with it. Right. So that I, just shows me that these guys do engineering as, as opposed to, uh, you know, just uh, another day at the beach, slap it wherever you want. So, yeah, and sometimes w w the, the, the pillar that we're talking about, sometimes <clears throat> that's dictated uh, by mold flow analysis or sometimes just uh, uh, the designer or CAD guy's uh, uh, impression about where it should be. And uh, sometimes, um, just uh, just to keep it from warping. So there's many different reasons why you put these pillars in um, or these ribs in. At the end of the day though, um, you have to take into account everything and that's what they've done here. They've taken into account what's gonna be going over the top of it. So I think that it's very important if you know that you're going to have a range in your production from a lower end vehicle to a higher end vehicle, you have to design the high end first. Right. Solutions that work for high end will carry over and work for the lower end vehicle, but it doesn't work in the other direction. Right. So another thing is you'll see the switches. These are top load switches. The top load switch closes out the wrapped edges of the material. A lot of companies now want to have a bottom load. Bottom loads work great if it's going into an injection molded part. However, for a wrapped part, it doesn't work. So you can go the other way. You can have a top load work into an injection molded part. You can have a top load work into a wrapped part, but you cannot have a bottom load work into a wrapped part mm -hmm. easily, whereas the bottom load works in an injection molded part. So I think it's very important. Start designing with the high end in mind and then go backwards. Right. And, and quite frankly, uh, <laughs> the real problem is that most people want to have that cheap car out first. Yep. And, uh, oh, this will, this will save us time. And usually it's like a convertible. If you design, a, a, if you're going to have a convertible and you design a hard top, well, guess what? Um, uh, making a convertible is going to be a nightmare because it'll twist and it'll, or you're going to have to have brackets on top of brackets on top of brackets. But if you design a convertible first and then make it into a hard top, you could have cardboard for the roof. It's still going to be stable. So. Uh, a little tip for, uh, for folks that, um, that uh, get into a management position or a director's position before they're ready. <clears throat> it's better to do the upper end first and, uh, and the lower end will take care of itself. I was always brought onto a program they would have their mid-cycle enhancement. <clears throat> so they've already had the vehicle in the year for one to two years. They want to add some more features to try and get more sales out of it. But they didn't design it with those features in mind in the beginning. Yeah. So then they have to produce all new tooling and they never even give the, the right amount of design staff and support 
at that mid cycle because they think, well, the vehicle's already designed. It's just yeah, cleaning yeah, up a few things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so anyways, uh, that, uh, about wrap it up. I think so. I, it will be very interesting to get into some of these other features once we can tear these things apart and see how they did it. Yeah. I want to see inside those doors. I want to see inside of that seat. Um, I want to see how they structured this rear seat. If they could have had a multifunction multi-position, cause I have seen vehicles yeah. that would have an angleable. Well, we saw seat. that in the, uh, the little, um, that, uh, the Chinese vehicle, the Imperium, we saw that that one, that one had the ability to move back. And in fact, the, um, didn't the Hyundai also have a, have a, a, a seat back? I think, I, think this, I think it also moved back a bit. I, I've worked on a few mostly, um, I, I do believe I worked on the Equinox that had that and a couple of others, but I haven't worked on the Hyundai myself. Mm. Well, um, we, did it, uh, we did it in the, uh, the Bentleys and the Rolls Royces when we were working with mm -hmm. them. I'm sure that this could make a, this could happen here too. So anyway, um, thanks very much for watching. Thank you uh, for uh, uh, all your comments. Um, you. I think that um, having Carl here <clears throat> to, uh, to look at the interior is gonna be a great uh, new asset for uh, us here at Monroe Associates. Keep watching and um, uh, we're gonna be tearing into the suspension first, then the electric motors. We've already got the top off, the, uh, the cover top off the, uh, the battery pack we're uh, probably going to discharge uh, a big chunk of that, and uh, and then we'll be able to get into the actual build of the uh, of the batteries. But uh, that's going to be uh, a little bit down the road. So anyway, thank you again for watching, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.